you may have seen the Army Special Operations Manual 101 for Intelligence Agents that was leaked some years ago, pardon me, and that it has a description of what Army intelligence officers are supposed to do about crashed aliens, how to box it up, how to browbeat witnesses and get them to shut up. And it talked about at least four races that we know are coming here. And it described the four races. One sounded exactly like the gray beings with the big black bug eyes who might be cloned biological units, actually. Robots, if you want to call it. And the second were humanoids that looked a lot like us and had the little fuzz on the top of their heads and a slightly grayish skin tone, I think, grayish yellow, something like that. And I think that information from that race was taken from the Eisenhower encounter. Welcome back. I'm here with Paul Blake Smith. Paul, welcome back. Well, thank you for having me on today's show. Okay, so encounters with President Eisenhower. Right. T uh, talk us through a little bit about his history with the phenomenon. When I was piecing together my Cape Girardeau story through all that research, I kept stumbling past this amazing allegation that President Eisenhower not only had his own UFO close encounter, but that he met with landed aliens during his presidency. And that sounds pretty outlandish at first. Mm -hmm. But the more I kept piecing together, I thought, well, I'm waiting for a book on this. I don't see a book. I'll re research it and write it myself. And I put together so much circumstantial evidence that it became a really good book, I think. Got lots of good reviews and sold well. And it's an amazing story. When I tell people this, they said, oh, yeah, I kind of heard of that. I'd like to hear more. Well, so did I. And it turns out that when he was president, Eisenhower waited about one year in office and flew out to Palm Springs, California on a golf vacation when he liked to golf in the Washington, D.C. area normally or fly down to his favorite course in Augusta, Georgia. That was only like an hour and a half flight or something like that. Instead, he flew 2,700 miles out to California to play golf not far from Edwards Air Force Base. So one night during this vacation, Mr. Eisenhower took off under the cover of darkness. And in my research, I found out that the president's traveling party put on a big party for the press at their hotel. And that would have been a great distraction to keep them from following Eisenhower around town. I believe it was Friday night, February 19th, 1954. So Eisenhower was able to get away from the media and local citizens and fly in, some say a helicopter, or at least at one point a chopper, maybe an airplane at first, to a town near Edwards and then was either choppered or drove to the base, a short drive, where he supposedly got out, went to an air base hangar, surrounded by six bodyguards, and met with some landed, friendly, human-like extraterrestrials. Now, the story goes that this was set up in advance. This was not an impromptu thing. I'm sure that if Eisenhower had been golfing in Palm Springs and you knew nothing about who had landed at Edwards Air Force Base, you would whisk the president out of there so fast it would make your head spin. But instead, he continued to attend to a, a few events and eat dinner in Palm Springs when he got the phone call by evening time that it, it was apparently safe to come to the base, that these were friendly, unarmed beings who invited Air Force officials aboard their landed craft. Three were circular, two were elongated according to a few different sources. And that meshes together well. And that a test pilot said he was called in to the airbase hangar to be a part of this entourage because of his great knowledge of aerodynamics and flight technology. And that they wanted his expert opinion on what they were going to see and what they did see. And the mm -hmm. aliens landed in five ships and got out for Eisenhower, again unarmed. I think they were wearing possible flight suits, but they were said to be pretty human-like only slightly misshapen was how the test pilot described it in the 1980s. He said, I want to tell this story before it dies out. He said, I've learned that now that everyone 
who was there has died, and I don't want to be the next one to go without telling the story. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. And as I did some research, this man came forward apparently in the weeks or a month or so after the death of General Nathan Twining, former head of the Air Force and uh, like Chief of Staff for Eisenhower for the military Joint Chiefs, very powerful Air Force man in 1954. He would have been a very logical man to have present and to even greet extraterrestrials if they came out of their craft. I will preface my remarks here for a second. And that since my book came out, there's been a number of stories online that cosmologists and scientists now believe there are many planet Earths in our cosmos and that they are evolving and growing different forms of human beings, that they are homo sapiens a lot like us. They speculate this. We don't know absolutely for sure. But this all hangs together with what this test pilot said he saw at Edwards Air Force Base. They were very much like humans. I'm guessing they had slightly different skin tone, maybe wider nostrils for breathing a slightly different atmosphere on their planet, larger chests or diaphragms for breathing in a different kind of air. There was one report that came out in the weeks after the event that talked about human-like aliens that have just a little bit of fuzz at the top of their head, no hair like us, and they were only about five foot tall, but they were very much like humans. I call this a kind of... Uh, family reunion, like you're visiting with your long lost cousins when you sit down on another planet of human type beings or homo sapiens. So they obviously would want to talk to the head man in charge, and that was President Eisenhower. Now you may ask, how was this possibly set up a year in advance? But according to what I've read, they used some special high frequency binary code and got answers back from an advanced race that were here and maybe made their presence known so that they set up a time and date in this remote Air Force base. You couldn't get any more remote than out in the desert, surrounded by a ring of mountains. That's what Edwards Air Force Base is, and it has the very latest flight technology center on the base. So there were experts there who could have taken a look at uh, what landed, and Eisenhower was flown in and always kept surrounded by six bodyguards, according to the test pilot. But he did greet the aliens who spoke English, and we're very friendly, mm -hmm. and they obviously had no evil intent, and they invited Eisenhower and his men, you want to go inside our spaceships and look around? The test pilot said Eisenhower nixed that idea just to be on the safe side. He didn't want to, to go in there and, you know, maybe suddenly things go wrong by accident, or it takes off and with the President of the United States into space. But I think that was the wise move. Apparently, there were two cameramen there recording this event for posterity. According to Christopher Barbato, who works the Vatican Beat in Italy, his sources told him they've got the footage. One is in black and white, and one is in color of Eisenhower standing there speaking to these beings with his bodyguards, and that they were friendly, and that they decided to put on two different shows for the president. The first was an air show, an aerial display. They got in their ships and said, look what we can do in our advanced craft that we can maybe teach you the technology or gift you something. And they put on this dazzling display and they said one of the craft got too close to the front of the base and shorted out one of the newsreel cameras that they were using, film cameras. And so the film footage ends abruptly there, but like the other film continues. So that was an interesting piece of trivia that sounds fairly believable. There's an independent movie made by a man named Christopher Munch just a couple of years ago called The 11th Green, 
in which he also shows Eisenhower meeting in an air base hangar, and there's two cameramen rolling on either side in the background recording the event as he understood it in his research that it was recorded. So wouldn't it be wonderful if someday somebody hacked into that and leaked it online or someone from the government decided, what the hey, let's just leak this to the public and see what they want. But so far, that footage has not surfaced. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email ads at gmail.com. The test pilot said the aliens landed and got back out to speak to Eisenhower. And that's when they put on their second show, which caused Eisenhower great embarrassment and great discomfort. The aliens were able to cloak themselves. They made themselves suddenly invisible. The test pilot said, we knew they were there. We could hear them, but they went invisible to our naked eye. And then they moved their positions on the runway in front of us and then reappeared. And Eisenhower was like, oh my gosh. You can't do that around here. You can't put on an air show like this. You're going to scare everyone. You're going to cause a panic. You can't land and teach people these abilities to appear and disappear. It would be a disaster. He said, our people are not ready for this. You're going to have to go and kind of urge them to leave. He really was a conservative man. He was a mm -hmm. hardcore Christian. He was the only U.S. president to be baptized in office in his first months in office. He took his Christianity seriously, and a lot of hardcore Christians have a hard time grasping that we are not alone in the universe. And when the evidence was right there in front of Eisenhower, he really was rattled. He tried to be as friendly as possible, but he wanted them to agree to something before they left. And that is not to show yourself. Don't put on a display over a major city and start a mass panic. Don't try to land and talk to people. If you do, we'll set up a base that you can go to out in the Nevada desert where you can study in peace and privacy, and we'll provide a little technology for you and some like bioplasma type samples. And in exchange, you, you do your studying of human life and plant life and animal life from this base. And apparently the aliens agree. Now, where did I get that information? And that's from a 2017 leaked document from January 1989. It's a Defense Intelligence Agency document, apparently for the incoming President George H.W. Bush administration. And it says in there, literally, President Eisenhower met with some friendly landed aliens in February 1954, and that there were two other meetings to secure, apparently, this agreement that they came to and needed signing. It was obviously not something he took to Congress for ratification, but it was of great national security importance and that it really did happen. And Eisenhower wanted to keep things calm. That was his main objective. Now, I think 1952 was the highest number of recorded UFO overflights in U.S. history. Like over the Capitol building. That was just one of them, but there were, yeah, you know, throughout many the United others. States. Yeah. Were these the, according to your research, do you know if these were the same species or beings that were responsible for that? And this was coming to a cres crescendo that's, and this is why yeah, they were meeting? That's hard that to tell. It's, yeah. yeah, it's hard to tell, but it's obvious that they wanted our attention. I understand the Air Force called these purposeful flyovers to get our attention to get people kind of broken in psychologically that we are here and we're visiting your planet and we have technology that's superior to yours. And don't be afraid, we're not invading. We're not sending down lasers or bombing you or kidnapping you, although there may have been some abductions by the gray race. And this is where we get to this race of beings described by Colonel Corso, Philip Corso in the Roswell story. And it may be, uh, well be the case from the 1941 Cape Girardeau affair. These gray beings were cloned biological robots. They have no feelings or emotions. They don't understand that we're scared when they're abducting us, looking us over and putting us back. So this makes a lot of sense for why they were identical and why they looked as if they were punched out of a mold, apparently by a higher race of being in a cloning lab and sent to Earth to do their dirty work. And that's just one race of beings that would be here. Apparently, there are a number of others. So you are correct. 1952 had scads of sightings, including one by 
General Dwight Eisenhower. He was still in the military in January 52 when he was on a mission to inspect European bases and American uh, readiness in case of war in case the Soviets attacked. So he was out on the USS Franklin Roosevelt, a ship which was carrying nuclear weapons, by the way. And he was inspecting that ship, and it met with a violent storm at night. He could not sleep in the middle of the night, according to this story that was printed in a New York City newspaper in 1998, I think it was, 97 or 98. A man says, I was there on the bridge when Eisenhower came up, I think in like a bathrobe and slippers, and said, I can't sleep, do you have any coffee? And so we poured some coffee and we're shooting the breeze with Eisenhower in this violent storm when outside was this spaceship that hovered right over us. And he said it didn't move and it seemed unaffected by the thunder, the lightning, the strong wind, the hard rain, which was rocking the ship. And we all stood there, including Eisenhower, and stared at this thing. He said it was a, almost 15 minutes worth, not a brief sighting. Like this thing really wanted our attention. So shortly thereafter, Eisenhower finished his tour of the bases, came home and announced, I'm running for president. I think I need to be commander in chief of this country. He had been resisting this up until the time of the sighting. You could make a case that this thing rattled him and thought, I already know about the Roswell crash. He was Truman's army chief of staff at the time. And he knew about this sighting in 52, saw it close up. And not only that, you go back to 1940s, when Eisenhower was the commander of the general services for the army in coordinating the Allied effort in World War II, when they kept having Foo Fighter sightings, these pilots kept reporting UFOs, orbs, daylight disks, things over the European theater. And he had to have gotten that intelligence report and knew at the time that we were being visited by superior beings with superior technology. So after this January 52 sighting, Eisenhower announced he will run for president. And of course, he won in a landslide. He was super popular. And he took office as like the most famous and popular man on the face of the earth. And so if you're an alien race and you wanted to come down and talk to the man in charge, Eisenhower was your man. You would go ahead with that contact of high frequency radio waves and you would risk landing and maybe being shot at which one story said that that's what happened. When the aliens came down in 54, they were shot at by an army general ordering his troops at artillery practice at the Edwards Air Force Base field range. And he said, look at those bogeys in the sky. Those are unauthorized craft. I order you to open fire. So they did. And a sergeant who was there that day said, our troops open fire on these five ships, three circular, two elongated, they came down out of the sky, and our shelling had no effect whatsoever on them. He said they silently floated along over the base and landed in front of this uh, airplane hangar at the far end of the base. And the general ordered us to cease fire and carried us off to get away from the scene. So somebody didn't get the memo that they were going to show up that day. And to show, I guess, their peaceful intentions, they did not fire back. And our best weapons could not damage them whatsoever. That had to have been a little unnerving, too. So that's the example of what kind of greeting you might get from Americans or maybe other nations, a little trigger happy like the Russians or Chinese. I don't know if these aliens tried to make uh, contact with their leadership. It's certainly possible, but they did want to talk to Eisenhower and did. Well, it's funny you mentioned when he was on that ship that there were nuclear materials yeah. or nuclear weapons on board because that tends to be highly correlated with sightings as well right over nuclear weapons bases around the country or even in england weapons silos ufos will be sighted and suddenly our technology to operate you know the machinery goes blank like they're sending us a message we know you have these things they're very dangerous and we don't want you messing around and we can knock them out like that if we have to that's speculative. They didn't actually say this, but you know, they're sending that message when you hear story after story of extraterrestrial type craft hovering over a military facility and suddenly we lose the ability to fire any weaponry. Now, where did you learn about this high frequency message 
that was sent where was the source for that story? i was on a talk show a few years ago talking about the cape Girardeau affair and a man called in and said i can't give you my name but i want to tell you you're on the right track i was part of a team that knew about the recovery of a craft in aztec new mexico it was almost perfectly intact there were dead creatures on board and some that were asleep and we tried to wake them up and they died all but one who spoke to us well anyway aboard that craft was a kind of radio communications device that was taken out of there and we learned to use it to send high frequency communications to other races and that's very interesting and in looking at some information that linda moulton howe uncovered there was this transcript of president reagan being briefed on ufos at camp david in 1981 and he mentioned at one point nixon showed me this device that they used a communications device that was taken from a spaceship and he showed this to me and it's part of the transcript and so that kind of adds more credence to the story that we got a hold of something and it was of great value and great interest and of course reagan decided i'm going to be president and he had great interest in such tales he may have had one or two of his own sightings so if this high frequency radio device with binary code was fully understood by our side and operating it they apparently exchanged messages and this friendly race came on down they had a specific motivation it's taken a gamble but the test pilot said they told eisenhower they were deeply concerned about our atomic weapons testing program that we're setting off radiation filled bombs in our testing in the land above the land way up in the atmosphere down in the ocean we're polluting planet earth we're polluting it with smokestacks factories cars anyways but you're mm -hmm. sending this radiation even into outer space when you keep detonating these atomic bombs and they wanted us to stop and Eisenhower said, well, I'm not going to stop and disarm unilaterally, according to the test pilot. And so the testing program continued. And the Castle Bravo program went off about eight or nine days later. And it was an utter economic or rather environmental disaster. Out in the South Pacific, there was huge amounts of radiation. People got sick. America was under fire. Eisenhower in particular for approving this that scientists were like kids playing with dynamite they didn't know what they had in their hands and it's as if the aliens who landed on february 19th tried to warn you that you know in advance to stop this testing program so it all hangs together as what you mentioned that they're very concerned about our atomic weapons and in terms of agreements were there any details on because I think you mentioned that Eisenhower was very keen on not letting them leave without some sort of an agreement. Right. Uh, what detail do you in, have on that? In that document from 1989, you can look it up on the internet, and it's printed up in my book, President Eisenhower's Close Encounters. It talks about Eisenhower agreeing to set up this base out in the Nevada desert, something like Painted Rock or desert rock something like that nevada and that they could land and do peaceful experiments there with our representatives present to kind of keep an eye on things and it almost sounds like this area 51 s4 that bob lazar described and a few other people have said that we've had ships and we've got a base where we're interacting with extraterrestrials who land i'm not the biggest expert on that so i didn't get into that and the lazar story it's interesting but i didn't get into that in my book and eisenhower agreed to provide our flora and fauna and samples and they would agree to bring us samples and technology of their own in an equal exchange of information and data and specimens and samples so how long this went on i don't know is it going on today i don't know but the document made clear that eisenhower agreed to this and that there might have been some amount of agreeing to allow human beings to be taken in a rural setting and looked over and put back as long as one race of extraterrestrials maybe not the humanoids were to make written account of this and who they took and you know names possibly locations and after a while this was not held up the agreement was not 
uh, held up by the extraterrestrials who began abducting people and looking them over, probing them and putting them back. So it's a wild story, but that could well be true that a man named Don Phillips worked for Skunk Works out in Nevada, and they had contracts with the government. And he said one day, I was allowed to look at this file of top secret stuff on this technology we're working on. And it said Eisenhower met with extraterrestrials who told them, you're so advanced, how can we stop you? So that Eisenhower kind of agreed to a, not a surrender, but a bit of a truce or a program where he did the best he could for us. And perhaps some people are being taken and there's not much we can do about it. So they're not invading, but they are very curious and they want to know what makes human beings tick and animals and plants and trees and maybe stalking other planets could be a possibility. It didn't say so in that document, but it made clear that there are races coming here and that there's not a whole lot we can do about it. When you say stalking other planets, say more about that. That's an intriguing hypothesis. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the Ruth Montgomery series of books? from the no. 1960s and 70s. She was a conservative newspaper reporter who was friends with Dwight Eisenhower and reported on him back in the day. I talked to her before she passed away in 2001. She said that I was, alas, not on that Palm Springs trip with Eisenhower. I was back in Washington. But she did a story in Florida about seances and transmediums. And one of the trans mediums provided information that just shocked her because it was quite accurate. And the medium says, you know, you can make contact with spirits from the afterlife or the astral plane yourself through automatic writing. And so she did a lot of automatic writing. These spirits would come through her with messages. And one of them said, there are extraterrestrials here. They are taking samples to stock other planets. And in case of future disaster on planet Earth, to also replant here, and that includes animals, and that they didn't say they're taking people away, but I speculate that that could have been going on for the last hundred years or more, that they're taking samples to stock other planets. The document did not say this, the uh, 1989 document, but it did say, amazingly, that by the early 70s, when Nixon was president, Diplomatic exchanges were going on. That was Air Force bases where aliens would land, step out, their representatives would go into an office and speak at length to our intelligence agents, and our own diplomatic corps, probably military officials, would get on board the ship and go for a ride, and maybe even to another planet, and come back through whatever method they have, interdimensional travel, wormhole, you know, uh, just beams of light, however they travel, and would come back and they filled reports that became very thick by the 70s on what we learned from them when they spoke to us and what our diplomats learned when they were away on these extraterrestrial craft. It's an amazing thing to ponder, but that's when Nixon was president and he happened to show up in Air Force Base on February 19th, 1973, with Jackie Gleason in tow, and that became my second book. So I'll admit I have not seen a document that says specifically that they're stalking other planets with our flora and fauna, but I find that very possible. We see sometimes large swaths just of plants or land disappear, and people say, like, how did this happen? Or some farm animals that have disappeared like cattle, and they just, they were here like, you know, last night and they're gone today and there's no tire tracks around what could have happened to them. So that is conjecture that it's extraterrestrial, but possibly this is what's going on. Any relationship to national parks and people disappearing? That well, could uh, be too. I don't have data on that. I did read online and you can't believe everything you read online, but a source said online I've seen some government documents because I worked for the government that said, you don't want to go into some large national parks. You don't want to encounter what is coming down there and going on in some areas. And so I would not advise going to that. And I never forgot that, that he couldn't tell more, but it was very specific as to something kind of creepy and otherworldly is going on at times in these undeveloped areas where there's not a lot of human beings around. And there's a lot of like Bigfoot sightings or UFO sightings and such. 
I've not seen documented proof other than this claim from a UFO site from a man who said he worked for the government and read this repeatedly that you don't want to go there. Now, in terms of the Nixon, Jackie Gleason story, let's go into that a little bit. Okay. Jackie Gleason came home one night in February of 73, and he was ashen and haggard and shook up like crazy. It was near midnight, and his wife said, what happened to you? Where have you been? And he said, I've been at an Air Force base looking at the bodies of extraterrestrials. Nixon showed me the proof at last. And he would get very upset that the government has been hiding this. And then he'd get all excited and very emotional because he was allowed to go in and see it at the pleasure of the president, his golfing buddy. Turns out Nixon and Gleason were good friends, had been for over 10, 15 years, and they liked to golf together. And Jackie was obsessed with UFOs and aliens. And he always asked people and even radio talk shows back then, if you can give me hard proof of extraterrestrials, I'll give you $50,000. Then he upped it to 100000 then half a million. By the early 70s, he was offering $1 million to anyone who can show me the hard proof that we are being visited, that we're not alone. Well, I think Nixon, caught in the Watergate scandal, needed hush money for his Watergate burglars. They were threatening to talk. So he had to go to this Air Force base and attend to maybe alien matters anyway. He took Jackie up on his offer for that $1 million that couldn't be traced. Jackie and Nixon shared a lawyer who was once arrested and went to jail for dispersing large sums of cash to the Watergate burglars. The story really kind of fits together very neatly. So Jackie got what he wanted, and to see the proof at last, he said Nixon took him to Homestead Air Force Base south of Miami, where Jackie lived, and showed him this secluded lab at the base, and they went inside. There was an armed guard out front, and there was a kind of morgue or lab, scientific lab, with these examining tables. And on four tables were four alien bodies. They were all about two feet tall with pointy ears and big bug eyes, not the Cape Girardeau aliens or Roswell or not the human-like ones that landed. That sounds in, like uh, the Hopkins. Yeah, exactly. Island. That's what I wrote yeah. in my book. It's an exact description of that race of like hobgoblins or whatever that came down and terrorized the Sutton family in Hopkinsville, Kentucky in 1955. So this was 73, and Jackie said they didn't seem to have any visible injuries, but they were dead. He was quite convinced these were real. It wasn't a hoax. Nixon was not a jokester or a prankster in any way. He was a very serious man. He said Nixon wouldn't tell him too much. But Jackie got the impression there must have been a UFO crash around here somewhere because we got the bodies and I saw them. Said that Nixon led him out of the lab. And another source besides Jackie's wife said that Nixon then took him to a airplane hangar that was visible from the highway. If you drive by the base, you can see this hangar back then. And inside the hangar was a silver craft, a round disc, that was kind of alive. It had been activated and was being held down by cables. It was up in the air within this airplane hangar. And of course, Jackie probably his eyes popped out, you know, like he would do comically on his show, The Honeymooners where he once paraded around as, I am the man from space. Back in 55, he had his own alien costume, and he wanted to get that out on the air and talk mm -hmm. about aliens in a bit of a way in a Honeymooners episode. Well, that's how obsessed he was. He collected over 1,700 books on the paranormal in his lifetime and magazine articles. They can be found to this day at the University of Miami Library. It's heavy on UFOs. Jackie was probably more obsessed with this subject than any American. He was just a civilian, but Nixon needed the money and he wanted the tour. So he got a little tour of what he'd been craving all his life. It was close to Jackie's birthday in February of 73. And as a birthday present, I think Nixon showed him for the price of a million dollars. So Jackie came home all shook up and he told his wife. And suddenly she mentioned this to a tabloid in the summer of 74, the following year. And the press descended on Jackie and said, your wife just said you were shown, you know, aliens by Nixon. And instead of saying, my wife is full of it, I never said that, that's not true, Jackie clammed up. He wouldn't give any comment. He wouldn't talk about it. So she wrote a book 
But she was writing a book in 1983, long after the two were divorced, and she wrote a full-page article for the National Enquirer and repeated this claim. Jackie told me all about the aliens that he saw at Homestead Air Force Base, thanks to his guide, President Nixon. And again, Jackie got on the phone and chewed her out. He was really angry. You're not supposed to talk about this and slammed the phone down and people inundated him with requests to interview him on this shocking story and he refused to talk about it he could have easily dismissed it and squashed it and just said you know this never happened so he died in 1987 without ever issuing a public comment but biographers have noticed that a couple of showbiz friends got to talking to jackie about aliens and he said oh i know they're real nixon showed me the proof and they said, really? What happened? And that's all I wanted to tell them. Nixon showed me the proof. And that's all I can say. In 2000, Jackie's divorced wife, Beverly, gave another interview and she reiterated everything, didn't back off a single thing, added just maybe a few more details. She didn't change or alter the story or say I was fibbing all along. And so that's where the story stands. And I tried to research it as much as I could for my book, The Nixon Gleason Alien Encounter. And both that and the Eisenhower book are from foundations, and they were so well received. They're now audio books from Tantor.com. And it's a well read story, and it's just so exciting. Presidents and aliens, what could beat this? And, you know, there's another president we could get to in between Nixon and Eisenhower that's rather interesting. Yeah, I mean, let's go there. All right. And Lyndon Johnson's presidential Johnson. records now digitized. On the exact 10th anniversary of February 19, 1954, in 64, Lyndon Johnson got on the phone and talked to, of all people, Dwight Eisenhower. Then he got a plane and flew all the way out to Palm Springs to huddle with him in private on the exact 10-year anniversary of this alleged agreement that was forged. Now, what they were discussing, I don't know, but of all the things that Lyndon Johnson could have done, he had to go meet in private with President Eisenhower, who lived out there on a golf course. And they went to the Eisenhower home, and then they huddled elsewhere. And for some reason, there were two Air Force Ones on the tarmac that day in Palm Springs. Johnson had no vice president. He did not name one until later in the summer and got elected president on his own with Hubert Humphrey as his running mate. So why were there two Air Force Ones on the runway? What was going on? And there were gaps in this printed schedule where Johnson could have slipped away and looked at something at an Air Force base himself with or without Eisenhower. Now, Linda Moulton Howe interviewed a man named Dr. Edward Moraine, who said, I worked at the Edwards Air Force Base scientific lab there. We did have an alien body. We did have some contact with extraterrestrials. And a U.S. president came to visit us in 1964. So that story kind of holds together. He didn't say specifically Johnson, but he was president in 64. And he didn't say what date, but he said it was in 64 that the president came here and looked over what we had. And who knows, maybe he had his own live encounter on maybe the 10th anniversary when he just had to fly all the way out to Palm Springs. Couldn't talk to Eisenhower over the phone at more length. Couldn't send an aide to do this to handle any communication, or he couldn't write it down. He had to go talk in private in Eisenhower's home. So, you know, that's very, very suspicious. And on February 19th of 68, Johnson flew out to Palm Springs and met with Eisenhower again on that exact day, February 19th. What was going on? Was it an update or an amendment or a change to this uh, agreement or treaty? And he wanted Eisenhower's advice on how to handle this unique situation. So here is February 19th, twice for LBJ, once for President Eisenhower. And that exact date is when Nixon was known to be in his presidential digitized records with Jackie Gleason at his golf course in Inverary, a golf course on Louder Hill, a suburb of Miami. And that's when they took off the, later that night. And in his digitized records, Nixon's records stop at 8.30 that night. And it says, a document has been removed from this file. What a coincidence. We can't find out. You don't learn about Nixon's whereabouts until the next morning. The next page re resumes his schedule and says he got up and ate breakfast and flew to Homestead Air Force Base to take off an Air Force One and leave South Florida. 
So what a shocking coincidence that the very time we want to look it up, a document has been removed from Nixon's files for February 19th after 8.30 at night, precisely when Jackie told his wife that was the time he and Nixon were together. They flew apparently by chopper to Homestead Air Force Base. They didn't drive there and looked things over and were probably choppered right back. There was a chopper pad right behind Nixon's house and Jackie Gleason's house, believe it or not. Jackie lived on a golf course and it had its own helicopter landing pad. So the whole story hangs together. It's very exciting. I wish we had footage, a photograph of, you know, the event itself. I wish we had more corroborating evidence or proof, but it's like so many stories, it gets squelched. You know, the government doesn't want to talk about this. They don't want to admit to anything. If somebody wants to hack into a file like a United Nations father got a hold of this, remember the skinny Bob footage of this strange looking extraterrestrial being, maybe real. That was former United Nations file that somebody hacked and leaked online in 2011. You see this extraterrestrial move and his head bulges a little and his eyelids go up and down and he's really creepy looking, but he seems friendly. And it kind of matches the Cape Girardeau 1941 crash bodies and the Roswell bodies. And, and it was apparently from KGB footage that America got a hold of and the UN had a file and it got leaked. And so I'm hopeful that someday somebody will hack or leak something on Cape Girardeau, Roswell, Aztec, New Mexico, the Eisenhower encounter, the Nixon Gleason encounter. There's such exciting stories from long ago, but unfortunately, almost everyone is deceased and we have to piece it together little by little today and hope we can make a coherent story out of it. And I think I did. Yeah, I agree. In terms of the beings that Eisenhower met, and kind of develop this footprint in Nevada. Is this the same group that Charles Hall called the Tall Whites? It's possible, but I don't think so. They're not tall. That's the, that's the yeah. Problem. That's the problem. I've read the Charles Hall descriptions, and it's quite interesting. And they got the right Nevada air base area, and it could be the same thing. A few weeks after the Eisenhower encounter, you may have seen the Army Special Operations Manual 101 for Intelligence Agents that was leaked some years ago, pardon me, and that it has a description of what Army intelligence officers are supposed to do about crashed aliens, how to box it up, how to browbeat witnesses and get them to shut up. And it talked about at least four races that we know are coming here. And it described the four races. One sounded exactly like the gray beings with the big black bug eyes who might be cloned biological units, actually. Robots, if you want to call it. And the second were humanoids that looked a lot like us and had the little fuzz on the top of their heads and a slightly grayish skin tone, I think, grayish yellow, something like that. And I think that information from that race was taken from the Eisenhower encounter. It's possible that tall whites were a part of this mix then or came in later. It's almost like opening up a Pandora's box, though. You make an agreement with one race, and what about the others that are capable of coming here? Will they feel emboldened to come here now and look around more than they used to under the umbrella of this agreement and feel like, well, we can do whatever we want. We know you don't want this gone public. You don't want to start a panic, so you would cover up our presence here. And it's just a little mind-boggling. But the tall white story is something that I mentioned in my Nixon Gleason book and how we had some apparent contact in the early 70s. And it's just utterly fascinating and kind of mind-blowing. I put in as much detail as I could cram in, as much evidence and sources and resources in all of my books to make sure the reader gets his money was worth to know it's not some flimsy fly by not unproven fantasy somebody made up somewhere. And I think the response has been good from readers. And my agent's trying to contact some Hollywood producers to get it turned into something for the big screen or the small screen. So keep your fingers crossed there, and we'll see what happens as the next year or two develops. All right, my friend, any final words to the audience? Again, if you have any inside information and you want to deliver it to me, you can find me on social media of most kinds, especially Facebook. And you can send it from my address listed on my crummy website, 
mo41.info and I'll eventually get it. If you've got a story you want to keep anonymous, leave your name out of it. That's fine too. Just make sure it's serious and real. A photograph, a diary, a photocopy of a page, a letter, most anything that might reveal some of this information would be most appreciated. Or just a little story that you've got, you want to pass it along in a direct message, that's fine too. And you can find my books on Amazon. And they're all from Foundations Books on Amazon or Tantor.com on audiobook. And I think you'll find them very, very interesting. I just got a review from somebody the other day and said, I could not put this book down. You need to get this book. And I thought, that's so nice to get uh, that kind of feedback from a lonely writer who's toiling away. I don't work with anyone. I just put this together as best I can on my own, research it, proofread it, edit it, write it, and rewrite it. It can get awfully boring alone doing this stuff, but that's the the nature of being a book author. So uh, I hope you enjoy it, and I thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. I'm confident the audience is going to love this. So thank you again. You're welcome. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe, and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel, and I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates program. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.